In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, wishing you all a very blessed and holy uh, Feast of the Cross today. Um, you know, when we're contemplating about the cross, um, it's funny, in the, in the readings of the month of Tut, this is the third Sunday of Tut, and the readings get replaced if we have a major feast, and of course, the Feast of the Cross is a major feast. And so we normally would be talking about Zacchaeus, and so I'm going to try to talk about Zacchaeus through the cross and how he was able to carry his cross. And we see the power of the cross in his life. Um, and, and as we contemplate on the cross, which is the most fundamental symbol of Christianity, we, we see it everywhere, right? We see it in the churches. We see it in our homes. Um, we see it anywhere there's a Christian. We see the symbol of the cross or the sign of the cross. We make the sign of the cross when we pray. We make the sign of the cross when we're scared. We make the sign of the cross when we're happy and we're joyful and we're thankful. We identify Christianity with the cross itself because it's through the cross that the sins of the world were forgiven. And it's through the cross that death itself was destroyed. And it's through the cross that joy came into the world and God was glorified. So the cross is ultimately a sign of victory and hope, even though it's sim simultaneously a symbol of sacrifice and death. And here is a big paradox in our Christian faith. New life comes from dying in Christ, right? Abundant life comes in self-denial and sacrifice. And the greatest meaning of life comes from learning to serve others, to sacrifice for others, and even die for the other. And it may sound harsh and difficult, right? Um, some may think the life of the cross doesn't seem like a life that I want to live. That's why St. Paul said, and he was very clear about this, the message of the cross is foolishness to the world. And yet, for serious Christians, this is the wisdom of God. And we discover deep, uh, deep meaning, deep um, benefits through sacrifice and self-denial. Uh, our Lord says, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It, it doesn't seem like a very inviting invitation, right? You know, sometimes our Lord, his words even appear a little discouraging sometimes to deny, deny yourself. Like, it's not a very popular idea in America or anywhere in the world to deny yourself, to take up your cross. What does it mean to take up something that during the time of Christ was a symbol of torture and death, right? What does that even mean to follow me? What exactly is this path that our Lord invites us to, to follow? And what does it mean for our lives? And so today I, I hope to take a moment to examine the case of Zacchaeus, who is originally the third Sunday, um, and see his life story or his passage in the, in the gospels with the lens of the cross, right? Um, Zacchaeus, when we find Zacchaeus in the gospel, we know his story. We know that he was literally up a tree, um, but he was also figuratively up a tree because, you know, he was a dishonest tax collector and he was looked down on. Um, he was looked down on by his fellow Jews as a collaborator and a traitor because he collected taxes for the Roman occupation. And he was not only a tax collector, but he was a chief co tax collector, right? And he was hated by many, like, like the IRS of our time, because many were known to be very greedy, right? And he lost his self-respect. He had cut himself off from God and from man, and he was alone. He was alone. And I think a lot of us in our lives, sometimes we feel stuck. We feel trapped. Maybe even COVID is uh, heightening that experience. And, and maybe we have a difficulty experiencing joy. And our discomfort in this state speaks to our innate desire for something better, for something greater than ourselves. And this is probably what drove uh, Zacchaeus to climb up the sycamore tree, right? And to see Christ, right? The one who might be able to answer his problems. And we see that he was facing some, some challenges in life. He had, in fact, two, two main ones that we can talk about, right? Number one, he was small. He was small in stature, and there was a large crowd. Okay, so let's see how he overcomes difficulties and challenges. St. Cyril says he was of little stature, not only physically, but also spiritually. Okay, so 
It's in our lowest spiritual levels that prevent us from seeing our Lord in our lives. And Zacchaeus couldn't see because of the crowd, but the crowd is, is the world. It represents the world. It represents the worldly life. And the worldly life, when it consumes us, it prevents us from living a holy life. And the crowd, according to the church fathers, it represents the obstacles in our own life with Christ. Our passions, our ego, our pride, our laziness, our doubt, and our fear, right? And what was his sol solution? His solution was to climb up a tree. And we'll come to this in a second. So what does Zacchaeus risk by climbing the tree? Yay! Certainly, the greatest thing that he risks is the mockery and the laughter of people. Yay! Sorry, I, I'm just going to make sure that we're all on mute. Okay. Um, so what does he risk by climbing the tree? Um, again, he risks mockery and being made fun of by the people. Often, the, the fathers tell us that the greatest obstacle in our quest for Christ is not our sins, but it's our fear of mockery. It's our concern of public opinion. I don't want to come off as too holy, right? I don't want people to think of me as some Jesus freak, right? And so, and that's, again, according to the church fathers, one of our greatest obstacles in our quest to see Christ or to have a relationship with Christ. And Zacchaeus overcomes this through humility, not putting himself down. Oftentimes we think that's what humility is, but realizing that the, great, the greatness of God, right? He desired to see Christ and his desire to see Christ was much greater than all the rest of the people, even those who were considered righteous because his humility was great too. He realized more than anyone else um, that this person of great value uh, who was walking through the city and he went to great efforts to see him. So just like Zacchaeus climbed up a tree, so we are too to raise up our minds above the earthly matters, above what's going on with politics and, and all the chaos that's going on in the world. We're supposed to transcend that. We're supposed to climb up our trees. Oftentimes, we are affected by what other people are around us doing or not doing, right? Oftentimes, the case of the youth they don't want to come to church or they don't want to come to youth meetings unless they find out who else is going. Same, times, same kind of thing happens with the adults. If there's a church, uh, there's Vespers, or if there's something like uh, some kind of event that's going on at church, it's like, who's going first before I decide if I'm going to go or not? We have to be careful of this trap. As long as Zacchaeus remain in the crowd, as long as we remain in the crowd, we're not going to be able to see Christ. It's as simple as that. So Zacchaeus left the crowd. He climbed above it. The last thing many of us want to be is different. We don't want to leave the security of being in the company of the crowd. But this is oftentimes required in order for us to see Christ and to stand with him. Oftentimes, he calls upon us to leave the crowd, to leave our friends, to stand with him, right? And sometimes in, in certain cases, to leave our family. Christ calls us to fight the strong public opinion in favor of the unchanging laws of God. So to be a Christian means that we're not crowd controlled, but we're Christ controlled. And Christ calls us to himself. Christ, who is God in the flesh, who knows the hearts and the thoughts of all. Of course, he knew Zacchaeus and he knew Zacchaeus' life and his reputation, but he also saw his desire. Zacchaeus desired the Lord more than anyone else in that crowd. And for this reason, our, our Lord Jesus Christ called to him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. Our Lord says, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And we see Christ entering his home. Again, I'm going to tie all this to the cross in just a second. Christ enters into Zacchaeus' home. Zacchaeus received Christ in his own home with joy. Of course, his home is his heart. When Christ enters our heart, there has to be joy and love and peace. This is the natural reaction. But what do the people say? They, they're still looking at Zacchaeus as a sinner. They don't see that he's changed, that he's a changed person. And sometimes this happens when we leave the crowd. 
the crowd complains, right? When Jesus went to Zacchaeus' home, it says about the crowd that they all complained and murmured he had gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. This loving, open attitude towards sinners was one of the first thing that turned the Jewish religious leaders against Christ. They even ridiculed him. And they said that Jesus is a friend of publicans and, and, and uh, sinners. So how did our Lord respond to this negative attitude? He said, I did not come to invite the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So who are the righteous people? Who are the sinners? The reality is that no one, that no one who is righteous, that there's no one who is righteous and there's only people who think they're righteous, right? We're all sinners. We're all sinners. And, and, and our, therefore our Lord is inviting us all to repentance. Yet if we think that we're righteous, then we're never going to be able to repent. And this is, the da- this, is, this is a very dangerous situation. This is the danger of, of judging someone, right? We think we know someone's heart and we pass judgment. But in the case of the people, they were very wrong about Zacchaeus. He, did, he was not the same Zacchaeus they knew from before. Only God knows the heart of each person. And therefore, even those things which seem so clear to us are in fact hidden only for Christ to know. Zacchaeus' life, it, it, it bared new fruit. It's simple to know um, whether we experience true repentance in our life or not. Is it, if it's just a shallow um, outward experience, or does our repentance bear fruit? Is there an actual change in my life, or am I still headed in the same direction? You know, repentance comes from the Greek word matanya, which literally means change in direction in our minds, change in our hearts. So how does this change happen? How did it happen for Zacchaeus? He changed on the tree. And the tree represents the cross. The change happens on the tree for Zacchaeus' life. And the same for us on the cross. The cross teaches us so much about repentance and change. The way of the cross is not popular and it's not easy. And without a deep relationship with God, it, it doesn't attract anyone. But the tree, in the case of Zacchaeus, is the cross. And we notice that every single year, the gospel of the feast of, of the cross is always around uh, Zacchaeus. And we always see this connection. So every time I want you to think of the tree, the sycamore tree that Zacchaeus climbed, I want you to think of the cross and how the cross helped Zacchaeus change his life. The cross represents sacrifice. Climbing the tree you know, as a child, you don't fear mockery. It's actually fun. People encourage you. But he was mocked. Zacchaeus was mocked because of his height. And he's a chief tax collector in his reputation. What will people say about me? No, we have to ascend above the crowd of people. Um, in, our, in, in other words, we have to ascend over the obstacles in our own life with Christ. And Zacchaeus was above the concerns of the people. He only wanted to see Christ. So don't hesitate to change. Be courageous. Be bold. Be bold enough to climb the tree and to take the risk of repentance. Be vulnerable to Christ. Um, it's been said, I don't take credit for this, but it's, it's been said, it takes a weak person to sin, but a strong person to repent. Right? And the cross also represents love. It represents giving. We also must live and love in the cross. Um, And St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life in which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who lived, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we have to be able to serve our family, to serve our friends, to love our family, to love our friends, to be thankful for what you have and what you don't have, right? To be willing to give what you have. And the sycamore tree represents love. Um, One of the contemplations is that the the leaves of the sycamore leaf uh, from the tree is kind of in the shape of a heart, which reminds us that love covers a multitude of sins. And the cross, we see the cross of change and repentance in the life of Zacchaeus. He was a a great example um, to take our sins to the cross. The, The sycamore tree is said to have a sweet smell. And that's, in the church father's mind, the smell of repentance. And it filled the whole house, right? Um, When we think about Adam, Adam covered himself with leaves of shame. But Zacchaeus revealed his sin in front of God 
and was saved by the tree and its branches. Um, one, of the, one of the nice sayings from St. Cyril, he says, do you see his repentance in referring to Zacchaeus? He who was guilty of great greed now frees himself from the bonds of money. He who was rich now becomes poor. He who wrongs others now restores them and gives them charitably. Zacchaeus gave out of love more than he needed to. If you look at the Old Testament law from Leviticus and Exodus and things like that, um, if you cheat someone, then they have to make restitution. And, and for example, in, in Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, if someone steals from his neighbor, he must pay double restitution. And in the Roman law, a tax collector who wrongfully uh, took the goods from, he had to restore double. And if he used force, then he had to restore threefold. Um, Zacchaeus goes even beyond that, bigger than the Old Testament and Roman law. He offers fourfold restitution. It, it shows the, the great love he had and the great change that happened in his life. When Christ enters our hearts and our homes, we have to ask ourselves a difficult question. Do we see the same change in our lives? When we take communion, when we go to confession, we should see this change in our lives. Repentance requires not just confessing, but a complete change, a complete 180 in our lives. The way that we look at our sin is completely different. And it's a turning away from sin into a service and a blessed life. Um, and so our Lord said to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So sometimes, unfortunately, when we're young, we say, oh, when I'm older, when I'm married, when I'm settled in life, when we get past this financial burden, then, okay, next time I see Abuna, I'm going to, I'm going to repent. I'm going to confess, right? When things get easier, I'm going to change. Um, I'm going to wait till I'm older. I'm going to wait until uh, the right time before I repent. We can't do that. Uh, James in his epistle, chapter four says, you don't know when, when, what will happen even tomorrow, right? And St. Paul says in Hebrews today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. No, our Lord says today. Today is the day. Today, saints decide to change. Sinners wait, but today sinners change, right? The saints change. He didn't let this opportunity to go by and he, and he saw Christ. We too should not let any opportunity go by when we can encounter Christ. Um, so today our Lord must stay at his house. It's a requirement and demand and the Lord is in his heart. God is waiting and we have to get back to ourselves. We have to ask our, our question, are we ready to climb on the cross? Are we ready to sacrifice our pride? Are we ready to give, to give all of yourself? So you must change, you must repent. And we all have spiritual trees that we can climb. Zacchaeus, you know, like today we will never, you know, we might not see Christ if we remain on the same level that we are. There are too many material things and there's too many people, there's too much chaos, there's too much noise in the level that we're currently at. I'm speaking for myself. We have to climb higher. Thank God that there are trees that we can climb in order for us to see Christ, to help us see Christ. There are different ways that we can, that we can climb and ascend above. First, there's the tree of daily prayer. Now, maybe because of COVID and things like that, it's been difficult to find a routine, but I, I implore everyone to find a daily routine in prayer. This is the first tree to climb, to get out of the chaos, to get out of the noise. Prayer is carving out time each and every day to stop and to be aware of God's presence and talk to him and be silent and to listen. Sometimes we hear in confession or in spiritual talks that people like to pray on the go on their commutes to work and things like that. I would discourage this practice. This is like a, um, a supplemental. This is an addition to what you do, but not in place of the only prayer that you have. No, it should be sacrificed. 
it should be, we should be still and we should climb this uh, tree of prayer. The second tree is the tree of scripture. We have to read the Bible every day. It is God's personal letter to us. It's the, it's the record of the revelation of itself. You know, we're taught uh, the Mosaic law. We learn from the history of the Israelites who repeatedly abandoned and returned to God, right? We're taught the wisdom of God through the writings of, of the prophet David and Solomon. We hear how to pray by reading the Psalms and actually praying them. We hear the prophets and we hear Christ himself speaking to us today. Uh, why would we want to avoid this? Why, would, why do we avoid the daily scripture? Thirdly, we have the tree of the liturgy and worship. The, the, the worship and the liturgy allow us to come down from our high places and to bow down and kneel before the mighty God, right? The fourth tree is the tree of the sacraments, especially communion, especially confession, right? All are, forget, are offered for the forgiveness of sins and for the health of our souls and bodies. If we're feeling off, if you're feeling off, maybe it's because we've delayed confession. Reach out to Abuna and I, or to your father confession, whoever that is. Make the appointment. Let's, let's be diligent about our confessions. Don't delay. Don't delay if you have an opportunity to come to communion, to take communion. The, the tree of repentance must be climbed. Our Lord said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So the cleansing and the purification of sin are essential for removing the scales from our eyes and from our hearts, preventing us to see Christ. So the tree of repentance also includes um, restoration, right? So if we have wronged anybody, if, if we've um, upset anybody, we have to make things right again especially in these times with our family members and our friends, we have to make sure that if I've wronged somebody, I reflect on that and I restore fourfold. Um, and the tree of service, this is another tree that we can climb. Don't think that because of COVID, we can't serve. Zacchaeus said, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. So with this, we remember the words of our Lord when he said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. What you did to the least of my brethren, you did to me. So we have to remember that we are all to be like Zacchaeus and that we are all sinners. We have to realize that we're sinners and we're all in need of God's salvation. We're in need of God's mercy and we're all short. We're all of st a short stature, spiritually speaking, in our relationship with God and often with other people. So we have to grow. We have to mature. Whether we're stuck up in a tree of bad circumstance or we've climbed up the tree to get a better view, let us also remember the tree of the cross, that our Lord Jesus Christ climbed for our salvation. And let us imitate Christ by living a life of self-sacrifice for the good of others. And let us remember that we are lost and our Lord seeks us out to find us and to save us. So just like God called out to Adam in the Garden of Eden, he said, Adam, where are you? God asks us this question to each one of us. Where are you? He does not ask because he doesn't know, but God asks because we don't know where we are. But by hearing his voice, we begin to know uh, where we are in relationship with him, near or far. And hearing his voice allows us to climb our spiritual trees in order to find the right path back to him. I'm going to end with a, a small quote from uh, Abuna Bishoy Kamil, who reposed, um, whoever loses his cross, loses his Christianity. And with it, loses his experience with the Father, for Golgotha had been a meeting place for man to meet with God. On Golgotha, man found love. So we Christians are to be a people of hope and never lose sight of the hope that's given to us through the cross. We have to take responsibility to take this message to the world and not be defeated by our fears and our insecurities and what the world might do to us. Um, we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross. Following our Lord Jesus Christ uh, may be an uncomfortable path in the beginning. It's a narrow path. It's a difficult path, but it, sometimes it's a path less traveled. And yet it's the only path that leads us completely into his kingdom and glory be to God forever.
Amen. I'll stop here the recording.